happens in the 1950s when you have both seaplanes and jet engines and nuclear bombs. You end up with a shed with a tailplane. No, you end up with this. The Martin P6M2 Seamaster. And we're going to get out of this stupid preview camera. I like using it because it usually looks good. But in this case, it, it, it doesn't. And in fact, this parking position has us. Wow. Okay. Uh, we're on the ground. So let me fix that real quick. There we go. In fact, uh, let's use Y to just... Why am I here? Yeah. There we go. This is the Martin Seamaster by Vatavia. Now, this aircraft was an experimental strategic bomber flying boat. Yes, talk about trying to fill too many jobs at once. Created by the Glen L. Martin Company. You might well know the Martin Mariner, for example. And the B-26. I think that was Martin. Yeah, it was. It was designed for the United States Navy and it almost entered service. And they were doing operational training. It uh, was expected to go into actual service in six months when the program was cancelled on the 21st of August 1959. Now envisaged as a strategic nuclear weapon delivery system for the Navy. Yes, the Navy wanted to play with the big bombs too. It was eclipsed by the Polaris submarine launched ballistic missiles, which, you know, ditched that. And of course, the Navy were going to use this as a high speed mine layer because that's what you really want to lay mines at high speed. Now, of course, only 12 were actually built and a couple of them crashed because they had some really weird flight tendencies. But we have it here in Flight Sim to Ply. Now, but if you've had some wobbly options, really. In terms of how they've brought some aircraft out. Now this one, of course, performance-wise, we're talking about 596 knots max speed at 20,000 feet. Cruising at around 460. Stalls at 130. Uh, with a range of about 1,800 nautical miles. Combat range being about 650 with 30,000 pounds of bombs. Now, there are tanker versions of this also. Or were envisaged to be existing. She has two 20mm cannons in the rear remote-controlled turret. She can carry 28 mines or other versions, 36 of some. And uh, in theory, she could also carry two or one nuclear bomb. Spicy, right? <laughs> so, like I said, this is from Batavia. What do we have? We have the, obviously, launch carriage. We have the stairs. Two cool candy features, not exactly in the world. This is controlled by your landing gear. This is controlled by the engines being off. Model-wise, it's a classic Batavia. It's okay if you don't look too closely. Their prices are still, I think, a little too high. We're talking 22 euros for this. Exterior-wise, it's it could be worse. The materials at least do look good, and it can, from certain angles, look pretty neat. And the idea of a jet-powered seaplane appealed to me greatly, because I like seaplanes. And I can put up with jets, so we're all happy. And how many seaplanes do you have with 20mm automated tailgun turrets, ejection seats? Yes, it's a seaplane with ejection seats. And four engines. Not many would be the true answer. Let's go inside, take a look around. Now this is going to be more of a, we're going to go take her for a fly and see how she behaves review than perhaps a here's a load of features review. It hasn't got a lot of features. We have the ability to pop up some modern Navcom radios and an ADF here. No I say new transponder, but that does appear to be a transponder, arguably. Unless it's giving me ADF frequency up to 1400. I think it's just ADF, actually, not a transponder. Ignore me! Not one of those! Not at all. Now, of course, we can turn on things like our crew visibility from there. Which lets us toggle those off in the cockpit in case we really wanted to see it without the crew in. We can do just that. And we can open the bomb doors down here from the tail hook key. Which opens our rotating bomb rack there. Which allows it to operate the bomb rack at high speed. So for high speed mine laying it could do that. Because it could actually do it quickly. We'll get the camera down here. You can actually watch this happen. Let me just go back inside. There you go. See the bomb bay rotates around. Now it's the same bomb rack they worked on for the camera. At the Martin company for the license built ones by them. So we have got that with mines in it. No nuclear bomb option unfortunately. Much to my chagrin. Let's close the bomb bay. Now, in terms of interior clicker features, we have, of course, got a yoke visibility right there for both of them. We have parking brake. We have our uh, trim. Uh, we have... What's this one? 
What do you do? That one wasn't in the manual. It just clicks. Okay, wonderful. I thought it did a thing, but it doesn't do a thing. So that's fine. You'd think it would do. Either way. Looking around the aircraft, we have numerous switches that are clickable. In some cases, some are not. Lights mostly. Basic functions that you would expect to have. Most things are up here on the panel. So start procedure, of course, is lights on. Master battery to on, which will be here. Now, it tells me to put the generators on now. So we're doing that right now. Total levers are idle. I'll make sure those are actually idled out for me. Fuel valve knobs to on. Now, the fuel valves need to be in those positions here. They are actually on by default. It's off when the line is there. So you want the, the ball with the lines joining the top and the bottom there. Only those two function. We only have two. Now, engine start is apparently as simple as in this version. Zoom out a lot here so we can see our RPM. Hold the engine starter for one until we hit 20%, which is down there. It's about a 10, 15 second hold. We're here at Wrangler, Alaska, by the way. This is available in the marketplace. We'll hold this a little bit longer here. And this one will start up. It says it'll start up. Whether it does or not is entirely another matter. It doesn't appear to want to. We'll, we'll try that again. We'll go with four this time. But it did say hold for 20%. I've done everything it told me to. Unless I've faffed something up, but I don't think I have. Hold it for 20%. Here we go. And... It just stops, which is odd. I have noticed this occasionally can happen in some of the other Vitavia aircraft. I'm not sure why, but I have noticed the same thing happening. I have followed the instructions. I'll toggle this other way around just to show you it doesn't actually do anything. Looking for 20%. That's the second line there. Now the fuel appears to be toggled to off, so we're going to wait for 20%. It's going to idle out on 18, it's going to slowly tick up to 20. We'll sitting at 20, we release it and it just goes off. Now if I press the magical control E, it resets that to where I had them, holds it up for 20 seconds, and then... starts somewhat surprisingly Ground November yep. tree Sierra X -ray this one just starts for up. why shut up go no this is what happens <laughs> no, shut up no one cares this is what happens when you use the AI pilot mode for a Christmas Day flight whilst you sit and write your book and wanted a young Kiss 52 to go flying across snowy Germany in the background. The AI piloting is actually a really fun feature. Now, like I said, I follow the checklists precisely in the manual. I can't seem to manage to get it to start up. So if there's something I'm missing, do let me know. I don't think there is because I did follow it precisely per the manuals which are in the folder for the aircraft. Uh, so you two can follow those. But we'll be following them for the rest of it. Once we get past this one, mine bay has been checked closed. Spray strips are set to down. Now, just to check here in my manual. The spray strips are here. How do I set you to down? Spray stray strips indicators. They're up when they're raised. Uh, nacelle doors indicate whether these type responds to position of nacelle doors switch in the center pedestal by engine one. Okay. Nacelle doors. Ah. That's what that switch does. Yep. That's what that does. It's not what that does. The nacelle doors indicator above these will respond to the position of the nacelle door switch. Oh, right. 
There's no dice or doll component to the model. Due to the lack of information about these parts, there isn't that. You know, it doesn't actually show you how to move those. That is unfortunate. I'm trying to look through the manual here for you to make sure I find this. But I can't seem to. The hydro flaps will be controlled by down here. That is those big ass flaps at the rear. Speed brakes controlled by, ironically, the speed brake lever. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Pull those in. We do have a transponder that is over here. That is these four knobs there. So we can set that by those controls. So if we go over here, we can set this. So clicking through there, of course. In this case, one. Can I see it there? One, two, zero, zero. One, one, two, zero, zero. So that's us set there. Okay, engines are started. We're going to taxi out here. So taxi procedure for this is pretty simple. We're on the cradle. So what we're going to do is just make sure we taxi the aircraft out. And that requires taking off our parking brake. Switching on my brains. And we'll advance the throttle slightly. There we go. So the engines are very quiet in the interior. And the exterior, as I'm hitting the wrong thing, because I'm still tabbed into the instructions for the manual. Quite loud on this. Interior, very quiet. Let's get ourselves taxied over here. We're just going to taxi down to the water's edge. I don't have any actual good big seaplane bases where I can taxi down to the water's edge. So we'll taxi off the edge of the water. Now, a comfort feature of Batavia included in this is that you can... Steer the aircraft in the water by just using your rudder pedals. There's no water rudder on the real aircraft. All would have been done by differential thrust, which you can do, but for comfort's sake, you can also, if you have one throttle, you can use the rudder pedals. So it's a nice feature in terms of making things comfortable. Now, as we taxi out into the water here, we're going to go sploosh, and we're going to keep our throttles up to get into the water proper. And the water spray from the engines is quite nice to see. And we'll get in here, and... All we do is just raise our gear, and it drops into the water, and plonk! And that is us down. Now, as you can see here, as I advance the throttles, I can just use my rudder pedals to steer, or I can let go of the rudder pedals, and I can advance my throttles. Which doesn't actually appear to be steering as much. Okay. It's a slight nuance, admittedly. Okay. So, taking off, I need to make sure my nose up trim is at 50% up. That is a requirement for takeoff in this, as is full flap. So, we're going to go to full on our flaps. They're big, but we need to get this thing off the water. So, we're going to accelerate up here. And it describes in the manual there's going to be some bouncing and porpoising in the sim because of the sim's water physics. So, we're going to just let this thing ride. And it advises not to pull up and try and force it off the water but just to let it ride and pull itself off the water surface. So, getting some mad porpoising. I'm just going to give it a little bit of back pressure, gentle back pressure, and away we float. Nice and easy. I'm going to pull those flaps in now. Nice and easy. There's some ships to say hi to. <laughs> There has something to be said. It may not be the world's best model in the sim, but there is something to be said about me flying a big seaplane jet engine or jet aircraft. Look at this thing. It's like a B-52 that went to the massive weight loss program. It was made badly. The visibility is, however, fantastic. Imagine having one of these prototypes and using it as a cargo plane in the bush of Alaska. I put a custom livery on this. I can take off from any waterway anywhere and provide basically heavy duty float plane services. In fact, if these actually went into service, they'd probably have made a fantastic air tanker. Got ejection seats, fantastic for cruise survivability, especially if you lose a wing or something. And, uh, you know, from overstress of multiple drops, like we see a lot of tankers will break their main spars. But also, fantastic visibility, great performance, speed. And imagine using this as a water bomber. Be amazing, wouldn't it? 
I think the Beriev is probably the closest to that. This Beriev B200, I believe it is the Russian one, which is a similar jet-powered over-the-top, but that one uses rather than low-bypass fans like this one. The Beriev, I believe, uses four high-bypass turbofans, the type that jet airliners use. To Google, Beriev B200. I'm pretty positive that's the right one. It is, in fact. And they do work as, fire, as air tankers. The Altair. Hey, you know what? Sometimes I remember things. So, uh, our trim is back to where we need to be, horse here. It likes to be fairly nose up. Uh, after takeoff, we've got our flaps up, of course. We've got everything set here. Now, approach and landing. The centre 500 feet line the landing zone. We're going to set ourselves up back there to parallel the runway. So, we'll turn downwind here. We'll pull the power back. We're going to try and slow down to 200 knots here. We're just above that. Okay, we'll have a lane. If we pass inside the island and to the port side of where that runway is and where the boat is off the end of the runway, we should be okay. Another vessel over there behind us. Okay, this is our downwind run here. So we're going to drop down here, power down. Let the nose settle. So we're going to be needing to make sure we set our pitch up trim on the nose in a minute. Okay, looking good here. Bring her along. We'll head towards this uh, island and we'll make our turn there. It seems like the safest bet. And we'll just do a U-turn for the turn to final. So we're descending to 200 knots, which we have done, and drop down to 250 feet. So we're going to drop that now. Okay, we're going to drop and descend as we turn. Landing flaps notch one set. Nose up trim 50%. Give it a little bit of rudder. We're going to bring her around here. Okay. So we'll notch one of the flaps and we're going to bring it down. We're too high up, but that's easy to drop. Passing through about a thousand feet, we've got plenty of room to drop into that uh, radius though. Okay. It does advise to descend at about 50 meters per minute towards the water surface. That's quite low. So we're set up on our track here. Uh, we're going to descend now to 150 knots. Oh, decelerate, I should say. But we can use our spoilers there. Okay, those are out. Flaps are going to be fully out now. We're going to hold the pitch in, which advises you to hold that pitch and just let it sink down. Throttles are pulled back. Let it settle here. The nose is a little high. Decide it to 120 to 50 feet. And at 100, we pull the nose up. We're at 100 right now, so we're going to pull that up here. Gently let ourselves sink down. And hold this attitude until we settle in. Nice. Okay, that worked just fine. She boings a little bit, but it's really predictable to landing. In fact, the instructions on how to land it, the speeds, when to do what do seem rather effective. So, for its porpoising, which I can partially blame on a Sobo, this is actually not an awful plane to fly when it comes to its water handling, because its approach and landing performances exactly as they say on the tin. And in terms of its ability to actually fly, it's pretty good. Takeoff is also pretty predictable. If you follow the instructions, it does work. So we're going to head ourselves over to here. Okay. And we have a water speed gauge there, which is our indicator just below us here. That's giving us our knots on the water. Whereas that is our course nuance of knots in the air, so it wouldn't tell the difference. We're at about 15 right now. We'll pick some speed up here. We can afford to pull the flaps in. There we go. A little quick now. Put you 40. 
Which you can do just fine. It's completely capable. Although it does boing along quite a bit. She does look rather nice in the water there. The spray effects have been well done and well used. Honestly, give Viteria some props for actually using them properly in the sim, because a lot of waterfront don't do it properly. Come on, let's get closer to the water's edge. Let's go. Come on. A little closer to the shore here. It slows down very quickly on the water's surface. We'll make sure we pop the cradle on, which is... Boink! The cradle is on, but it hasn't popped out of the water yet, because it's still down... Oh, there it goes. It pops out now. It's a little janky, maybe, but <laughs> we, we put up with it. And now it actually behaves like it's on land. So we're going to taxi out of the water here. And be just fine. Come on, piggy. Let's go. There we go. And we're out. And that is us here on the ground at Wrangell. So what do I think of the aircraft? It's typical Batavia. It's not great in terms of interior. It's not great in terms of exterior. It's a little better on the exterior than some of their aircraft. The flight model is arguably one of their better ones because you can get some a flight model fixed for the Sterling. The Skyhawk was crap. And it's been a rough run for Batavia in terms of their aircraft options. I don't think this is terrible. There goes to shut our engines down and it opens the doors and flies the stairs, of course. I don't think it's terrible. 22 euros is definitely still too much. I think if they dropped their price to 15 euros, they'd actually be pretty fair, actually. I know it's sort of hard to think of something not being worth what you're actually asking for it, but given that we can get a Carinado quality plane for 20 euros, it's not a particularly fair comparison. Now, they are niche aircraft nobody else will do. Which is odd and unusual and, and appreciated, but I do think it's a little bit on the extra side. Just my thoughts and my opinion. You decide what you want to do. If you like your seaplanes and you like some weird, go for it. Honestly, I wouldn't mind a bury if someone wants to make one of those. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.